So uh, my talk today is, uh, is going to, I think, continue along a lot the lines of a lot of what we've seen so far today. Um, if, if you are hoping to see a cell paper level detailed analysis of the question about what, uh, about what my lab has demonstrated are, are the links between Alzheimer's disease and cancer, um, I'm afraid you will be disappointed by the next 30 minutes. Um, However, what I'd like to give is sort of a perspective from one particular corner of the neuroscience field on how these two processes uh, might be related. Um, there's a, a great deal of, uh, a great number of changes have, have happened in the space of blood-brain barrier biology and CSF biology over just the last couple of years that have fundamentally changed the way we think about processes of interstitial homeostasis and CNS immune surveillance um, that, that I think have implications both for the setting of Alzheimer's disease and neurodegeneration, but also for our thinking about how uh, peripheral processes like cancer might influence this, those. So I'm going to be focusing on that. This is going to be um, a bit of a perspective or propaganda piece. So uh, view, it, view it as such. These are my disclosures. So a piece of work from my lab is uh, funded, that is relevant to this talk, that is funded by GlaxoSmithKline. I've served as a consultant for GSK uh, and Shire. Um, so we've heard, uh, we've been addressing today what the possible uh, bases for the connection between Alzheimer's disease and cancer are or what they might be. And we've heard a lot about um, possible biochemical, biochemical connections um, using um, GWAS data or SNP data or pathway analysis. Um, my talk isn't going to focus on that at all. It, it, rather, it's going to focus on the notion of whether there is an interacting system that interacts both with cancer and with neurodegenerative disorders or neurodegenerative diseases that, uh, that may be common between the two, such that the influence of one upon the other or the, the influence of, of one of those pathways upon this common interactor uh, may be the basis for uh, the, the observed epidemiological connection between uh, risk of AD and, and, and cancer. So uh, I'm going to focus very specifically on, uh, on a couple of subjects. There's going to be sort of three vignettes of descending order of, um, uh, of how half-baked they are. All right, so the first one is, is well substantiated by literature, um, the, by literature and scientific uh, work. The second one is a little bit less so, and the third one is even less so yet. But I, I think in the spirit of a conversation about these processes, it's worthwhile. All three center on these, the question of how we think about CSF interstitial fluid dynamics and the implications that has, that has uh, on, um, on processes like waste clearance, which, with, which Kathy uh, meant, which is an, a, a term that can encapsulate a lot of different things, but also uh, CNS immune surveillance. So I'll be talking a lot about uh, the interactions between CNS and the adaptive and the innate immune system, and I'll be talking very specifically about how this may play out in the setting of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease um, in, is a, a, a clinical construct or a clinical entity that my group focuses a lot on. We believe that the biology that we study, which is the biology of the brain interstitial fluid and the brain cerebral spinal fluid, is very basic to just how the brain functions. And so it's probably relevant to almost any neurological condition that you could imagine. But over the last uh, five years or so, much of the work that we've done has, has been done through the clinical lens of Alzheimer's disease. So um, this talk will, will, will reflect that. In particular, we're, we're interested in a couple of the features of Alzheimer's disease in particular and neurodegenerative conditions in general. And that has to do with the question of, uh, of selective vulnerability to the process of protein misaggregation. So Alzheimer's disease, like uh, virtually all the neurodegenerative diseases, is characterized by the misaggregation of different proteins. In the case of AD, it's the uh, misaggregation of amyloid beta in the extracellular compartment into amyloid beta plaques, or the formation of neurofibrillary tangles in the intracellular compartment that are made up primarily of uh, misfolded hyperphosphate related tau. A biological piece of this is how inextricably this process is linked to the aging process. So incidence of Alzheimer's disease or risk of Alzheimer's disease doubles about every five years over the age of, 50, uh, over the age of 65. And incidence of the disease uh, 
approaches 40% over, uh, over the age of 85. So there's this, there's this rock solid association between the aging process and this process of protein misaggregation, which is true not just of AD, but also of other neurodegenerative diseases. Even in cases of familial AD, where the disease is caused by a very specific uh, gene mutation, usually in the amyloid processing, in the amyloid, amyloid processing pathway. Uh, even though that, that mutation is present throughout life, it still takes decades for that disease to manifest itself. So there's some connection between the vulnerability of the, of the aging brain to this process of misaggregation and the, develop, the development of the disease. The second uh, feature of the, of the disease that our group is interested in understanding the biology behind is the regional vulnerability to this process of mis protein misaggregation. So we now know based on uh, CSF um, biomarker studies and uh, PET-based biomarker studies um, that this process of MIT protein aggregation, particularly amyloid deposition, begins decades before the onset of clinical symptoms. So we now see that um, the, the first stages of, am of detectable amyloid deposition begin typically in people when they're in their 40s and 50s, um, even though we d wouldn't expect the clinical symptoms in people to uh, arise until people are, are much older, in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. That amyloid, uh, early amyloid deposition occurs preferentially in certain regions. So even in these cognitively intact subjects, you see that it occurs in the frontal cortex, in the temporal cortex, in the pecunias. And then with, uh, with, with, the, with the march of age and the continued development of Alzheimer's pathology, you see that other regions begin to, begin, begin to become involved with the deposition of amyloid beta. And whether that's because that regional vulnerability that is unique to these places spreads, or whether the, the pathology itself spreads in, in what's come to be thought of now as a prion-like manner is a, a, an issue of active debate, debate in the field. But this question of selector vulnerability, both of the aging brain in general and different regions of the brain in particular to this, uh, this protein misaggregation is, is, the, is the biological question that my, that my group is um, most, clo most closely fo focused on. So that leads to a, a general question in, that the Alzheimer's field has been dealing with for the better part of uh, 20 years now, is trying to figure out what it is that's changing in the aging brain and in these regions of the brain in particular that renders it vulnerable to protein misaggregation. Is it that uh, amyloid beta production in these regions is more rapid, or is it that the processes that normally are clearing away amyloid beta um, begin to fail? And I'm, not, I'm gonna sort of shortcut a whole bunch of work done by a lot of really great groups and, 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 and simply state that there's a consensus that's emerged in the field that in the case of familial AD, where there's a, where there's a disease causing gene, it, it is of course, it's the overproduction of amyloid beta that's driving that disease. But in the case of sporadic AD, it appears that it's the failure of the clearance of amyloid beta from the brain as it ages and in the brain as it converts to Alzheimer's disease that, that, is, that seems to be one of the driving factors behind the deposition of amyloid beta, uh, of amyloid beta in, the, in the brain. So it, it appears that there's an impairment in the clearance, uh, in the clearance of amyloid beta. Getting to the bottom of that, uh, and, figure, and figuring out what is the basis of that impa impaired clearance um, brings us to the subjects of interstitial homeostasis. And this, is, this, this conference is actually a perfect example because when I go home for Thanksgiving and tell my parents who are not academics what I do for a living and I say, I study interstitial homeostasis, they look at me blankly and they say, does that have anything to do with cancer? And the, the truth is it might, um, but I don't, I don't try to explain that to them. But it turns out that interstitial homeostasis is incredibly important to the function of, uh, of all organs. In the periphery, the way, that this, the way that this works out is it's through the concerted action of the blood vasculature and the lymphatic vasculature. So this is uh, a diagram like you would see in an undergraduate, in any undergraduate textbook about how this process works. So the basic idea is, that there is a fluid that surrounds all the cells of the body called the interstitial fluid. It occupies the extracellular space. That fluid is generated as an ultrafiltrate from the blood uh, from the blood column as it comes across the the wall of the uh, uh, the precapillary arterioles or the capillaries at the very front side of the vasculature into the interstitial space. Uh, 
And then some of that fluid is taken up on the back side of the blood, of the blood vasculature and returned to the, to the venous side of the, uh, of the blood circulation. But actually a fairly substantial uh, portion of that interstitial fluid and virtually all of the protein that is present in the interstitial space gets taken up by these, uh, by these lymphatic structures, so primary lymphatics that uh, move uh, proximally, uh, kind of collecting up into larger and larger vessels, eventually reaching collecting vessels. And then as those vessels um, will, after a long journey, essentially dump their contents into the, into the, the blood circulation. And so this combined action of the blood circulation and the lymphatic circulation is how the brain, or how the, uh, the rest of the body takes care of interstitial homeostasis. Now there's a couple features of the brain in particular that make this process th different. So the first is the presence of a blood-brain barrier. So unlike the leaky capillaries of the rest of the body, the, brain, the brain's microcirculation is, is sort of connected and bound by tight junctions that re really restricts the movement both of water and of different solutes so that water doesn't move quite so freely into or out of the brain and certainly solutes like potassium or sodium or, or glucose also don't move uh, as readily. So on the one hand, the, inter the brain interstitium is hermetically sealed behind the blood-brain barrier. On the other hand, there doesn't appear to be, or at least it hasn't been thought, that there are lymphatic vessels uh, in the CNS tissue. So uh, not only is there less of a way for fluid to move into the brain tissue, but there's less of a way for interstitial fluid and interstitial solids to be, to be cleared away. And what that has led to is, is the general view within this field that originated in the, uh, in the middle of the 20th century with Hugh Davson, with the notion that the CSF compartment serves a quasi-lymphatic role. So the CSF uh, compartment, which is this, uh, this, uh, this clean, clear, uh, protein-free fluid that surrounds the brain and sits within the ventricles of the, of the brain, that it, it subserves some of the, 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 some of the roles that the, that, the, uh, that the lymphatic system does. So the idea is that as the CSF is produced within the ventricles, uh, by the choroid plexus. It flows out into the space that surrounds the brain, which is called the subarachnoid space. And then uh, the way the interstitial homeostasis works in the brain is that as solutes, which are produced within the brain tissue, uh, they begin to exchange through diffuse processes, either internally with the, uh, with the CSF of the, uh, the ventricular system or externally with the CSF in the subarachnoid space. And through that diffuse process of exchange, which could involve uh, molecular diffusion or could involve involve bulk flow, that's the way that interstitial homeostasis works in the brain. As this, then, so then as the CSF uh, is reabsorbed through sort of two canonical pathways, one being uh, arachnoid granulations, which are these protrusions of the subarachnoid space into the, the, the dural sinuses, which are big veins, essentially big collecting veins. Um, as CSF is taken up back across that pathway, or as CSF um, is cleared to the, uh, the nasal lymphatics along the cribriform plate, um, that's the way the interstitial solutes eventually exit, exit the cranium. And this has been um, our thinking and our understanding of how this process goes um, for the better part of 50 years. Now, these, these ideas, however, are undergoing undergoing a great deal of change in just the last couple of years. So one of those changes has to do with the question of whether the exchange of CSF from the outside of the brain and interstitial fluid within the brain, whether that exchange is diffuse and unorganized and slow or whether it's organized and rapid. And this is the, this is the main biology that my group has studied over the last five years and that, my group, that forms kind of the, the, the lion's share of my, re, my own current research program. Um, and this is incidentally the biology that I, probably not, I will actually not be talking very much about today at all. So uh, this, is, this is what has been termed, termed the glymphatic system. So this is uh, not lymphatic with an L, but glymphatic with a GL. Um, the idea is that there is a network of perivascular, so around the blood vessels, uh, pathways by which CSF from the outside of the brain exchanges with in the interstitial fluid within the brain. The way that looks is like this. So if you inject a fluorescent tracer into the subarachnoid space, here we've injected it back at the cisterna magna, 
what you observe is that it arrives at the brain surface along the peel, vas along the peel vasculature, specifically along arteries. And then as you follow those penetrating arterioles down through the tissue, you see that the CSF tracer will follow those arteries down into the tissue, and it will begin to exchange with the surrounding interstitium, suggesting that there is a, a fairly rapid and organized exchange of CSF, so the fluid from outside the brain, with the fluid in between, in, in between the brain cells. On the other side of things, we observe that there's a similar but um, differently organized uh, uh, structure to the way that interstitial solutes are cleared out of the brain. So if you inject uh, th essentially the same tracers, so this is a three kilodalton uh, dextran, if you inject it into the uh, motor cortex here, you see that it, it, it doesn't move out in a sphere, which is what you would expect if it was just diffusion out from the point source, but it follows very particular anatomical routes. You see that it follows what it fo moves um, and uh, it moves um, inferiorly and medially. It moves toward the ventricles, so it moves toward the uh, kind of posteriorly toward the third ventricle and the lateral ventricle. It tracks very rapidly along white matter tracks. Um, if you look even more posteriorly toward the uh, where the great vein of Galen exits out and kind of forms the junction of the straight sinus, you see that the tracer follows that. So as we move posteriorly through the brain, you see that the, that the interstitial uh, tracer moves toward the ventricular compartments and eventually out toward, the, uh, toward where the uh, sinuses make, make their origins. So there is, a, um, there is a fairly specific organization to the way that the exchange of CSF and interstitial fluid happen throughout the brain, and it is generally organized along the axis of the vasculature, the arterial vasculature organizing CSF inflow and the venous vasculature organizing interstitial fluid outflow. That's one change that has happened in the field over just the last couple of years, and that is almost the last you'll hear of that. Um, the second big change is one that, ha that, that came about about um, 18 months ago. So this was the summer of um, 2015 in back-to-back -back reports um, that came out of Yoni Kipnis's lab at University of Virginia and the other out of Kerry Alitalo's lab in uh, Helsinki. Um, was, were reports of what to all appearances are classical lymphatic vessels, not within the CNS, so not within brain tissue, not within the spinal cord, but associated with the CNS. And this, um, up, this sort of overturned a lot of people's thinking. Now, this wasn't the new discovery of uh, dural or br brain lymphatics. These had actually been seen and characterized previously, but for most of the people who are in this field, this was sort of a new idea because it wasn't something that was widely thought of or was wide, widely regarded. What this looks like is that associated with the sinuses, so this is a mouse here, so this is the superior sagittal sinus, this is the transverse sinus here, this is the confluence of the sinus. What this looks like is that embedded within the walls of the wider sinus, so I've labeled uh, blood endothelial cells here with CD31, which is uh, PCAM, it's a marker for endothelial cells. Um, you see strings of what, uh, strings of small vessels that uh, label with LIV1, which is a marker, which is a very specific marker of lymphatic endothelial cells. And you see these stretching all over the, the dural sinuses and stretching all over the transverse sinuses. The group from uh, Kipnis, Kipnis's group suggested that these were primarily dural, associ uh, dural sinus associated vessels. Ali Talo's group, which is the, the Finnish group, did a little, I think, more careful um, uh, anatomical characterization of this, and they saw that these lymphatic vessels actually were um, very abundant down, down within the skull base, within the cisternal compartments there. So when we talk about cranial lymphatics, these are, these are lymphatic vessels that are embedded within the dura associated with the sinuses, associated with the other elements of the dural vasculature, and sitting down within the, down within the skull base that appear to drain uh, solutes both from the brain tissue and from the CSF down to the deep cervical lymph nodes, which we think of as being outside the blood brain barrier and in the periphery. So where that leads us is, this, I, is to a place where we think about, or at least I think about, and I think maybe everyone should think about, the CSF as a sort of a crossroads, a crossroads between uh, what's happening inside the brain behind the blood-brain barrier and what's happening outside the brain and peripherally. So we, now, we know that if, if we inject a tracer into the CSF at the, at the uh, uh, at the cisternum magna, so into the cisternal subarachnoid space, we know that tracer can get into the brain. So there's an ability for, for fluid to move that way, and we also know that interstitial fluid, in contrast, moves the other way and can get out to the CSF. So the CSF is in exchange with the brain interstitium. 
On the other end, this, so this is in vivo imaging that's uh, done at the superior sagittal sinus. So this is a, a blood, uh, a green tracer is injected into the blood, and this is the superior sagittal sinus with a big vein coming off of it. And what you can see are, dis, uh, are discrete um, tracer-filled vessels that have leukocytes within them sort of lining up single file. So this is a dural lymphatic vessel that is embedded right in the, right in the, uh, right in the roof of the uh, superior sagittal sinus. So we have uh, lymphatic vessels that can take up CSF, and then as those lymphatic vessels sort of travel their course down into the skull base, so this is a view into the, into the mouse skull base. So if you've ever looked into at, at a mouse brain, if you remove the brain out of the skull, this is, what you, this is what you see sort of in the floor of the skull where you have the trigeminal nerves running this way. One of the things that you see are that uh, CSF tracers they move uh, very rapidly down along vessels at the, um, associated with the trigeminal, uh, the trigeminal nerves and the other cranial nerves moving through the skull base. If you continue to move further down to the deep cervical lymph nodes, which are down in the neck near the, near the bifurcation of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the internal carotid, you see that tracers injected in the CSF move actually very rapidly down into these lymph nodes. So we've injected here two different tracers a 70 kilodalton and a 2 million Dalton tracer into the CSF. And you see pretty rapidly, you see tracer begin to fill in uh, the, the subcapsular sinus. Um, if we do counter labeling uh, with, uh, lymphatic endoth Ugh, just with lymphatic endothelial cells, you see that, um, there we go, you see that uh, this tracer is, is strongly associated with the lymphatic endothelial lymphatic endothelial cells of, of the deep cervical lymph nodes. So what this shows is that there's, there's a clear anatomical connection that allows things, solutes, and tracers from inside the brain to move into the CSF compartment and from the CSF compartment along these, uh, these dural lymphatic vessels and from these dural lymphatic vessels eventually down into these deep, deep, cervical, deep cervical lymph nodes. So the lymphatic vasculature then uh, is connected to the parenchyma, uh, to the parenchymal interstitium through the CSF compartment. The CSF compartment is then a, uh, a sort of crossroads for the communication of presumably information between those two places. So does any of this have anything to do with, Alzheimer, with Alzheimer's disease? The, the straightforward and the honest answer to that is we don't know. So um, the identification and, characteriz and characterization of these lymphatic vessels is new enough that only that, that so far nothing has been published regarding the, the potential role of these vessels um, in, the development of in the development of Alzheimer's disease. Um, a prior study in, animal, in rodent models of AD, so rodent models that develop spontaneous amyloid plaques, it was observed that amyloid deposition occurs in these deep cervical lymph nodes, right? So that's, that's not human AD, and it's not, it doesn't necessarily demonstrate that these vessels participate in the development of the disease. Um, there are a lot of groups currently within the US and around the world that are starting to ask this question. The NIA just uh, completed um, review of an RFA in which they are asking this very specific question. They're looking for proposals investigating whether there is a role of this lymphatic circulation in the development of Alzheimer's disease. And so far, the, no one really has many results. Here's some things that we do know. Um, if you inject amyloid beta into the brain, uh, fluorescent amyloid beta into brain tissue, one of the things that you see is that it leaves the brain and uh, associates with lymphatic endothelial cells. So this is the way that you can do this kind of imaging is you actually pull the skull cap off. So you pull off the calvarium and you, you image it, uh, you stain it and image it as a decalcified whole mount. So this was one of the innovations that uh, came out of those first two characterizations of the, uh, of the lymphatic vasculature. And one of the things that you see is that a fluorescent amyloid beta uh, exits the brain out along the, uh, the, the different sinus structures. So this is the transverse sinus here. And that, that it's associated with lymphatic, endoth lymphatic endothelial cells that are running right along the margins of, of, that, of that vessel. As you look at that amyloid beta and how, or, and whether or not it makes its way down to the, um, whether or not it makes its way down to the deep cervical lymph nodes, you see that it does, and you see that it does in a 
um, in a really interesting pattern. So this is, these are taken from the same animal. So this is an animal that's had interparenchymal amyloid beta injected. And you see that the A beta is detectable in the deep cervical lymph nodes. You see that is, it's entered into the subcapsular sinus, which is the, the part of the lymph nodes that sort of sits just under the surface. There's a population of uh, macrophages that live in the subcapsular in, that live in the subcapsular sinus, one of whose job jobs is to pass antigens off to B cells living within the uh, within within the uh, the lymph nodes, and it appears that the amyloid beta is being taken out fairly specifically by that cell population. So this suggests that at least for exogenous amyloid beta, we don't know if this is true for endogenous amyloid beta. It appears to be cleared from the brain parenchyma through the compartment of the CSF all the way down to these uh, deep cervical lymph nodes. What this has led to is, is, this, mo what, is this model of combined, uh, combined, combined function between what we initially characterized as the glymphatic system, which is this paravascular network, with what has more recently been characterized as this lymphatic, this classical lymphatic uh, circulation. Um, this is a review piece by Yoni Kipnis uh, that was just published in Neuron last year, um, where it sort of describes how this relationship goes. So the idea is, if a solute needs to make its way from, if a solute needs to make its way from the brain parenchyma, it needs to move from the inter brain interstitium all the way out to the, to the, uh, to the uh, lymphatic vessels. And it does so first by traversing from the parenchyma into the CSF compartment. And in doing that, it uses these perivascular pathways. And then as the CSF is, uh, uh, moves into these lymphatic vessels, the combined, the combined function of these two pathways is how solutes from the brain interstitium can get cleared out of the brain. And, they, and then they highlight, very sp they highlight the idea that in Alzheimer's disease, this may be a process that's both active and may be going wrong in the setting of disease. So if we propose then that amyloid beta is being cleared along these perivascular pathways to the CSF, which is why you see CSF in this, uh, which is why you see amyloid beta in the CSF and why it can be used as a biomarker, that amyloid beta can then be cleared via the, the lymphatic vessels out of the brain and that this is one of the presumably major routes by which A beta is cleared from the brain. And then as with the onset of age and with the onset of disease, these exchange processes, whether it's the uh, movement along these perivascular pathways, whether it's the circulation of the CSF, or whether it's the, the ability to be taken up by lymphatic endothelial cells and eventually trafficked down to the deep cervical lymph nodes, those exchange processes begin to be impaired in the setting of AD, and that's what underlies the, the, that's what underlies the development of the disease. There's no data for the, that supports this. This is all a this is all a proposition. There is there are there are some very recent findings that support this idea, though. So this was a study that was published three weeks ago out of uh, Moni De Leon's lab at NYU. And this is a study where they were looking at actually tau tracers, but they weren't looking at tau binding, they were looking at something very different. What they did is they injected IV tau PET ligands and measured their kin the kinetics of their movement through the CSF compartment. So instead of looking for tau binding in the brain, in the brain parenchyma as a measure of neurofibrillary pathology, they simply measured the kinetics of, of uh, inflow and clearance into and out of the CSF compartment as a measure of how fast things were getting uh, in this case, a tracer from the brain parenchyma into the CSF. And one of the things that they observed was that uh, if they calculated uh, either the amount of exchange that was happening within the uh, ventricular compartment or the rate of exchange that was happening into and out of the ventricular compartment, Alzheimer's disease subjects compared to normal age, uh, age match controls exhibited a slower rate of CSF turnover. What was interesting, though, is they also looked at a, uh, an ROI that corresponded with the superior nasal turbinate, which is a, a place on the backside of the, the acribiform plate where CSF is thought to be cleared out of. And they observed that this ROI had exactly the same time activity curve than did the CSF. So that means that the movement of tracer through this compartment had exactly the same kinetics as the tracer moving through the ventricular space. And they observed the self-same difference where subjects with AD exhibited less CSF turnover across the, uh, the nasal turbinates 
uh, than did normal cognitively intact control, suggesting that this process of CSF uh, exchange and CSF clearance um, does appear to be associated, its impairment does appear to be associated with the development of Alzheimer's disease. When they looked at um, amyloid PET binding um, in these same subjects, they saw that there was a very strong association between uh, decline in the kinetics of CSF turnover and amyloid PET binding, suggesting that uh, worsening amyloid pathology was associated with slowing of the CSF turnover. So this is the closest thing to human validation of this, of this, um, of this, uh, this biology that we presently have and the closest thing to uh, evidence that this is actually uh, important in the development or in the course of Alzheimer's, in the course of Alzheimer's disease. So then where we end up is we know, we know that the meningeal lymphatics, they appear to be important route for the clearance of amyloid beta. We know that slowed clearance of A beta in the aging brain, it may confer vulnerability to amyloid deposition in the development of AD. That could either be because, be because the glymphatic pathway, it, which is the exchange from the brain parenchyma into the CSF is slowed, or it could be because um, the movement of, tr of uh, solutes from the CSF out into these lymphatic vessels and down into, the, down into the deep cervical lymph nodes and out is slowed. We don't have a clear, uh, we don't have a clear sense of whether either of those is true and which one is, which one is, um, which one is the more important. But it raises a second, another set of questions, which is that whole model presupposes that the only thing that these lymphatic vessels are, great, the only thing that these lymphatic vessels are due is serving as a drain for amyloid beta, but that's not the only thing that lymphatic vessels do. The lymphatic vessels um, are also importantly imp in involved in the process of immune surveillance. So one of the things, uh, so we know that amyloid beta is cleared uh, from the brain parenchyma to these uh, meningeal lymphatic vessels. We know that it's cleared to the deep cervical lymph nodes. Importantly, we notice that there is an uptake of amyloid beta by these uh, subcapsular, macro, subcapsular um, sinus macrophages, which have a very specific biological role, which is taking antigen that comes in from lymph out of the antigen I'm sorry, antigen out of the lymph and passing it to B cells so that those B cells can begin to mount an, uh, an antibody-based response. Um, it's, interest, it's interesting to note that in, in the setting of Alzheimer's disease, this is, here we're looking at amyloid beta monomer. So this is a, a roughly five kildalton tracer. But if you start thinking about amyloid beta oligomers, which are, uh, can be many orders higher in size, um, the role of these macrophages in, in this process ends up becoming important, such that the ability of the brain, uh, the ability of an immune response to amyloid beta or amyloid beta uh, uh, oligomers or misfolded conformers uh, may depend on the presentation, uh, its ability to drain to the, the deep cervical lymph nodes and its presentation using these, these macrophages. Um, is there any data that support that? And the answer is maybe. So in two different studies, this is the first one, we know that there are autoantibodies against amyloid beta circulating in people all the time. In fact, some of the, uh, some of the uh, antibodies under clinical development for amyloid immunotherapy came from healthy control subjects. Um, the, the, they're, they're antibodies that these people have endogenously that are thought to perhaps confer protection against amyloid deposition. So if you look at su uh, subjects with Alzheimer's disease, who have high amounts of these antibodies versus low amounts of the antibodies, you see that people with low amounts of the antibodies have actually greater levels of diffuse plaque, suggesting that the presence of these autoantibodies against amyloid beta may confer protection against the process of misaggregation. Another study, this was published in 2001, suggested, suggested that uh, in Alzheimer's patients, uh, there were lower levels of amyloid beta specific autoantibodies in the CSF of Alzheimer's subjects compared to cognitive intact controls, suggesting that the ability of the body to mount an adaptive immune response to an amyloid beta may in fact protect it against uh, the development of disease. So then, um, I'm gonna pass by this since I'm out of time, but then the, the, the idea is this, the, the, or the main point is this. 
our thinking about how the brain interstitial, brain interstitial homeostasis uh, happens has changed a lot in, in the recent past. We now know that there's an anatomical route by which CSF and interstitial fluid exchange. We now know that there are uh, lymphatic vessels associated with the dural sinuses and the skull base by which uh, solutes, including amyloid beta, are cleared to the deep cervical lymph nodes. This is, it appears to be a route for amyloid beta clearance. We think, um, and, I, and I would propose, that this is also a route for the development of amyloid beta autoantibody production um, that may re uh, influence the resistance, the body's resistance to amyloid plaque deposition. Um, and a paper that was just published in the last couple of months also suggests that there are phosphotau specific auto autoantibodies that are present in cognitively intact control people. So this may be a much broader process than, than just the relevance to amyloid beta. And then what I didn't really get to is the, is the role of microglia and CSF-associated macrophages in the active degradation of amyloid beta. And it's important to note that these CSF-associated, the, the resident macrophages within the, uh, within the CNS are typically associated with CSF structures. So where are we at in the relationship to cancer? Uh, are there direct alterations in CSF interstitial fluid exchange in the aging or Alzheimer's disease? Uh, yes, we, we, we do know that that's true. Uh, is there lymphatic drainage of amyloid beta? It seems like it. Is there a systemic uh, change of amyloid beta or non-amyloid beta uh, autoantibody production? Um, we don't know if that's true in Alzheimer's disease or not. Um, uh, oh, here we go. So in the, in this, so we don't know what, so one of the things that we, we think about is in cancer is are these, um, are these drainage pathways altered by the systemic inflammatory state that, that, that characterizes cancer? Are the B cell responses that are able to be mounted within the, uh, in the lymph nodes altered by um, other immune, immune responses taking place elsewhere in the body? And is there, is there an influence of those systemic inflammatory processes um, on how the, how the brain maintains um, protein homeostasis through the interstitial compartment? That, those are questions that I think are worth, worth uh, asking. So with that, I'll take any questions that you have. Thanks. We have time for one or two questions. Um, I think there's one right there. Thanks, that's a great talk. Um, how, does, how do these models of, or ideas about reduced clearance and impaired antibody-mediated clearance of A-beta fit with the idea that the pathologic direction is low levels of CSF A-beta in Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. So the decline in amyloid beta, specifically 42, within the CSF is, is one of the key kind of di current diagnostic features of uh, probable AD, right? Um, and it's strongly associated with the, the presence of amyloid deposition that can be described with amyloid PET. So that has to do with essentially where the amyloid is able to sit sort of thermodynamically. So if you're, if amyloid beta 42 in particular is very fibrillary, and so if it's, if it's begun the process of aggregation within the brain, that, that's a thermodynamic process by which um, free A beta 42 sequesters very rapidly out of the soluble phase into association with the fibrils and with the plaques, and it becomes essentially inaccessible to the ex exchange. What's important to know is that other markers that are not quite so fibrillary, like amyloid beta 40, don't exhibit the same kinetics. And so that's sort of a, so the ability to exchange into the CSF has to do with both um, production and exchange, but also its, its, its chemical interactions and its binding interactions with, with, with any partners. And once you start that aggregation process, um, it essentially can't escape. You see the same sort of thing actually with, with, um, with misfolded tau. It has, uh, misfolded tau has the ability to sort of sequester free, uh, free tau out of solution and make it less available to the, to the CSF. Um, but that's, that's a little bit of a different story. Yes? Do you think the glymphatic system represents a new route of delivery of either a pharmaceutically active product, an antibody, a small molecule, or even a vaccine? Is there a way to inject into those lymphs and get things into the brain? Yes, absolutely. So everything, so I framed this, a lot of the talks I give are framed from the perspective of waste clearance, talking about how amyloid beta has gotten rid of. 
but the same pathways and the same processes are the processes by which things from either the CSF or things from different regions of the brain may distribute throughout the rest of the brain. So there's um, actually a great deal of interest in, um, in the private industry, in private industry, in using these same pathways to distribute things from the, the CSF compartment throughout the neuropel. So if you can, so like in lysosomal storage disorders, if you can do enzyme, if you can uh, infuse enzyme for replacement into the either the lumbar interthecal space or into the basal cisterns, you can use the same exchange pathway to deliver enzyme replacement to different brain tissues. Similarly, different drug companies are looking at this as a route for um, for biologic or AAV or virus delivery um, for either gene therapy or immunotherapy. So it, the, the very same uh, routes by which we see tracers exchange could be used for the delivery of different uh, therapeutics. We have time for one more question. So we know the mast cell is pretty abandoned in uh, in the blood brain barrier. Uh, what is the role of uh, the f dysfunctional or functional the, uh, integrity the mast cell may affect the uh, lymphatic drainage? Yeah, so in, in the peripheral lymphatics, mast cell degranulation is thought to be one of the processes by which age-associated lymphatic impairment occurs. So if you can, so for example, uh, there's a, a group at, um, a group in Texas that's reported that if you can stabilize mast cells and prevent the histamine release that comes with degranulation, then you can prevent the uh, con impairment of lymphatic contractility that you see in aging animals at least. In principle, the same, you, one would expect the same thing to be true of the dural lymphatic, the, the dural lymphatics. But the answer to that is um, we, we just don't know. So um, no one has yet published um, what is the effect of aging or disease on the function of these vessels. These vessels at this point have only been characterized on a sort of histological basis. What markers do they express? What cells are they associated with? No one has yet published a functional assessment of how they act and how that activity changes in the setting of disease. That's, I think, um, why they, this, this biology represents a, a potential place where um, as we learn more about how they work and how, how their, their function changes in disease, we'll begin to understand a lot, of, a lot more about just the basic bio, uh, biology of how the brain functions as an organ. And I think that'll have a, a, a lot, that'll tell us a lot about a lot of different bio, um, disease states, not just Alzheimer's disease, but also neuroinflammatory conditions and others. Thank you. Thank you.